Wahiguru Jiki Fateh, welcome to Sikh channel Community Matters. I'm very pleased to be joined by two distinguished guests today, both of whom have a long standing association with Sikh channel and support this community broadcast. I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Gert Randawa, Director for the Institute of Health Research at the University of Bedfordshire. Welcome, Gert. Thank you so much for having me on. Pleasure to be here. And also a very familiar face, certainly to myself and the Sikh Channel team, Jaskamal Singh Sidhu, Executive Principal at the Guru Nanak Sikh Multi-Academy Trust in Hayes. Jaskamal Singh Ji, welcome to Sikh Channel although you are very much part of our Sikh channel team. Thank you, Mr. Bal. It's always a privilege to be part of uh, Sikh channel and uh, it's, it, is, it is an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll, we'll get straight at it. Gertrude Randhawa, you work in the field of public health, coronavirus. We were beginning to think this was behind us. The company, was, the whole country was vaccinated, double jabs, and we were looking forward to normality. And then suddenly, Omicron, what's going on? So I think, you know, the, the good news is firstly that Seek Channel is shining a light on COVID and shining a light on what we as a community can do. So thank you so much, Seek Channel, for hosting this program. The less good news is that when you have a virus, um, it can mutate. And unfortunately, until we vaccinate the whole world, mutations will occur. And Omicron is a new virus that's occurred. And what we need to do is to protect ourselves. And what we're finding out about this new mut mutation is that it's particularly concerning because it's uh, transmitting so quickly. And that's why the whole world is worried about it. And that's why it's so, so important that everybody gets vaccinated and gets um, their first vaccination, their second vaccination. And if you're eligible, gets their booster vaccination. Now, I know many people in our community have been vaccinated, but the data does show that still um, our non-white communities, including us Sikh communities, we're still less likely to be vaccinated than others. So I still think there are people out there who haven't had any vaccination, and I would encourage you to do so. The analogy I use is it's like a seatbelt. If you're in a car crash, a seatbelt is likely to prevent serious injury. It won't guarantee it, but it gives you a higher protection and the vaccination is the same. So please get a booster if you haven't had one, or if you have had no vaccinations, please get them. And if your children are old enough to be vaccinated, please encourage them to get vaccinated too. And within the Godwaras, please, please, please wear your masks and please adhere to social distancing. So there we have a very comprehensive and very helpful public policy message from Gertrude and Dawa. Thank you. But Gert, this virus, it's got a natural cause. Don't we simply just let it spread through the population? It can't be stopped. It's hardly transmissible. And uh, as you said, we're in a car. We need to travel. We can travel with a seat belt on, but we still need to keep moving forward. And we should simply let the virus run through the population and uh, build immunity. That is one argument, but what I would argue is if you do that with a, a condition like COVID, which is such a high fatality rate, you will risk killing millions of people around the world who didn't need to die. And so the, the example I would give you is, for example, South Korea. South Korea has got a, a population of 50 million people. It's only had just over 4,000 deaths, and they've managed to avoid lockdowns by keeping everything open, but most importantly, they kept everything open using public protection measures. So they've ensured that people have worn masks, kept social distancing when indoors, um, and they've avoided lockdowns. 
They've kept uh, transmission rates low um, and their economy has actually thrived because they've not had to shut down the country. They do have protection measures such as quarantine for people who visit their country, um, but you get used to those measures. And I think that's the challenge. In the UK, back in May of this year, the government removed the need for wearing masks in secondary schools. Um, and I think that was a mistake because what that did was it got COVID cases really high in this country. We've ended up now having nearly 40,000 cases a day since May. And that's meant that the infection has just circulated in the community. And that's how new variants occur, which is why, you know, the, the other challenge is not just in the UK, but other rich countries, we need to help low income countries with their vaccine infrastructure. We need to help them build vaccine factories and help them to get yeah. vaccines right. in their populations. Good, thank you very much. If I can come on to Jess Gummel. Gert mentioned there about schools and wearing masks. It's been hugely disruptive for schools and school children. Jess Gummel, and do you want to see the end of this pandemic? And do you think it should, we should let it run its course and not try and uh, stop transmission because it, it does seem inevitable, especially with this new virus. Uh, I think one thing that we have we have already learned um, about this virus is that that um, we can we can adapt and we can we can um, carry on taking our measures and uh, and uh, collectively we can um, uh, put the strategies in place. But this virus is is not not um, to go away anytime soon. We know that it's it's here to stay and and we just have to learn how to live with it. Now, um, you know, government is doing um, their part by introducing strategies and, and implementing a number of different measures in place. And um, as a school, I know that we have um, we have briefings coming in every single day, um, which is which is um, good four or five pages long on, on, on daily basis. You have to sit down and read through and understand what the next step is going to be and and these measures and these strategies are changing every single week because we we keep adapting um for example i agree with uh, mr randava uh, you know a few weeks back it was absolutely fine for us to say that masks are not required anymore and then we can carry on with um with school day um and and education can can carry on in the classrooms as as per normal um but that norm normal changed very soon because um a couple of weeks back, we got another briefing where um, now masks are required. And last week, it was said that now it's not just masks. We are actually moving into uh, Plan B, which is that we have to be absolutely careful when we are um, when we are um, attending any any communal places within the school, and um, we have to carry on with the masks and with staff as well and yeah. with students. We are enforcing uh, throughout um, our setting that masks are important. So, um, and, and the sure. testing is completely different layer to it because, you know, we were, we were absolutely um, relaxed on, on testing a few weeks back. But now uh, the latest um, guidance is that we need to, we need to do testing um, every week and, and twice every week. And, and if um, the close contacts, uh, you know, if you recognize uh, as a co close context, then these, this testing has to be on, on daily basis for seven days. So the, the guidelines and, um, and, and we are um, adapting to these guidelines on, on daily basis. And this is something which is going Sorry. to happen throughout, throughout next, yes. next years. And we are, we, we are learning to live with this now. The guidelines are very onerous. What's the effect on the children? What's the effect on their education? Is it, is it a disproportionate effect? Um, I think it, it's a very, very difficult question to answer, Paji, because, you know, we are still in the process of pandemic and the effects or after effects would only be realized when we are out of, the, out of this problem. And uh, at the moment, we are, like I said earlier, we, we are learning on, along the way and uh, we are adapting as, as, as much as possible. The biggest effect is that yes students are missing um the classroom learning but 
I think um, schools and educators, they agreed when government said that, and I personally, it was my uh, personal opinion that looking at uh, how things went last year during lockdown, um, students absolutely suffered because they didn't have that face-to-face -face teaching. Um, either we call it blending, le blend, blended learning or, or online learning, um, it didn't work because, because there are a number of elements and, and number of factors which, which affect um, teaching and learning overall. And um, students were absolutely left in dark um, due to those um, two lockdowns that we saw last year. So now, when we are coming back in the classroom this year, September, you know, things started to look normal and then we wanted to, and I agree with Mr. Randawa that we, we should have been a bit more careful um, because um, now we are looking at the repercussions and you have students again, um, especially with, with um, key year groups like year 11 and year 13 who are um, moving forward with their, with their qualifications. Um, they are in next couple of weeks, they would be they would be um, for their uh, GCSEs and A levels, and they still haven't got a plan. They still are waiting to see that how things will unravel in in coming months, and obviously their future is is at stake here. And and we just yeah, have to say, yeah. we just have to be responsible. Effect. There's a very big effect on the students, and uh, there's all sorts of issues there with mental health as well as their education being affected. And we have reports, we've had a, a very recent confirmation again from, from a top South African doctor that the symptoms are very mild. It's a mild disease and intensive care units are not being overwhelmed. So what is the proportionate response to this new variant? Do we need to go into all this uh, social distancing and masks and vaccinating children? Uh, Jess Gummel, do you think we need to do all this? Because the cost may outweigh the benefits? Um, I think, you know, I think we need to do everything in our, in our power to, to um, avoid any, any sort of uh, mishappenings in future. I think it's important that, that we, we support um, our students in terms of uh, uh, to understand what, what lies them. Um, um, you know, biggest concern is that teacher, teachers play a very important role here. And um, if you look at the figures, I think it, it, it was part of uh, today's briefing from DFE that um, that staff absences have gone 20 percent um, higher than last week. And that is absolutely, absolutely, um, um, you know, it, it's 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 challenging. For, for schools to adapt to something like that, because there are a number of head teachers I, I know now, they are thinking about closing down those year groups and they are going back to online learning because they don't have staff in the classroom. So it's important that we, we put those measures in place. Of course, like students are part of it, but teachers play a very, very important role. And there are a number of teachers who are, um, who are vulnerable and uh, they, um, they, um, they need those uh, vaccinations. They need to be very, very careful moving forward. And there are teachers who are responsible for our students. And, and like I said earlier, students need those teachers not um, on the other side of the computer, but inside the classroom. So um, yes. that face-to-face that -face teaching can carry on because then nothing Thank can you. replace that. Thank you, Jessica. Well, Gert, would you support another lockdown if it came to it? Are you in favor of a full lockdown? I've never been in favour of lockdowns and the example I've given you uh, from South Korea is not involving lockdowns. I think this is where our country um, has not learned from its past mistakes. The best way to manage any virus is to keep it low um, in the community and the best way to do that is to use public protection measures such as mask wearing indoors, social distancing mask, and, and washing. Masks alone can't contain this virus. I mean, South Korea is a very case in point. They perhaps don't have the same travel as we do. Uh, the, all 11 countries have just been removed from the red list. So there is now free and open travel to the UK with testing. So it is a different type of uh, country and economy. And it may not be possible to isolate in the same way as, as South Korea. We are very different, but an international community. And we have populations from all around the world here in the UK. 
so <clears throat> so do Australia, so does New Zealand, so does Taiwan. Um, they've all adapted um, minimal COVID measures because they focused on trying to protect the public and avoiding high levels of deaths. So I think these are difficult choices that each government has to make. So I'm not saying this is easy, but I think there are ways of keeping the country open and safe. So for example, I, I personally think the government could fund schools to have air filters, fund schools to make sure that they have good ventilation, um, and therefore schools would have much lower rates of COVID if they had better air quality. That's not for schools to solve, that's for government to solve. I would praise schools what they've done during COVID because they've done their best and they followed whatever government guidance they've been given. Um, but I just think, you know, that we could do so much more. It's, it's true for all workplaces, universities, colleges, any business, you know, if we want to keep COVID rates low, we need to make sure that our workspaces are as safe as they can be. And that also goes for places of worship, so gurdwaras, mandars, mosques, churches, etc. We need to encourage people to wear masks, to keep uh, social distancing, because what we need to remember is people um, who've got underlying health conditions, sadly, are impacted much greater by COVID and much greater risk of death. And that's happened more so in our communities. So we don't want people to get this virus and we want people to therefore have the vaccine and ideally be protected from having any of the virus in the first place. So I would just encourage people to be careful. Thank you very much. Just Kamal, there's been a lot of publicity recently around the uh, antics of the uh, central government, Downing Street, in terms of setting a bad example. What impact do you think that's had on the children at your school when they've uh, seen the Prime Minister in his office being very severely criticised for breaking rules? As much as I would lay away from, from politics, because I think everyone everyone has been aware of, of what has happened. And and um, with, with students, obviously, when, when it comes to children, I think it's important that we um, we set uh, a good example in front of them. We we are we are the role models that they that they see us as role models, and also they they um, try to mirror what we do. So it's important that we set good examples in front of them, so they can follow. Um, and um, I think it's important that um, it's important that we look at the figures and and realize that things have 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 changed. Um, because you know, when 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 you look at um, earlier this year, when they rolled out, when the government rolled out the vaccination scheme for for young children, we had um, you know we had we had team of um, NHS um, nurses who came in and and did the vaccination for our, for our school, and uh, it was quite successful. But um, we had quite you know forty percent of parents and and students who. Who refused to get that vaccination, um, and and they were absolutely clear that they don't they don't need to be vaccinated. Um, but then um, we sent another survey out last week because we we were contacted by NHS that they, they want to come in and 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 do the vaccinations again. So we sent out the survey. There were ninety parents who who said that they would like to go ahead and 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 and, and change their mind now. So. I think people can people are thinking uh, for themselves now, and they 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 are now making decisions based on what is happening around them. And obviously, they are learning, um, and and they are adapting. So that is going to be for next many years. This this is this is going to carry on. We will make mistakes, and we will learn from them, and we'll carry on. But it's important that we always reflect and see um, that we don't repeat our mistakes. That's going to be very very important. And and students, um, you know, when you speak to them, when when I talk to them, they're always aware of a uh, number of um, they, they talk about love talking about conspiracy theories. They love talking about um, what exactly, you know, the rationality is and reasoning. Um, and and we, we don't we don't want to get engaged into into that into that um, discussion with them, because that's something that they will have to decide for themselves, obviously. But again, I think they are making these decisions based on what they see around 
um, them and and what exactly is happening in the, in, in, the, in the country like we all we all are aware of the, of the data and and statistics seeing the prime minister's office breaking the rules Gertrude and Dawa, will that make it more difficult for the government to enforce COVID rules? So I don't follow COVID rules because I want to please government. I do it because it's going to protect my health. It's going to protect the health of my family, my friends, my community, people I live with, people I work with. And I think that's why most people are following the rules and choosing to get vaccinated and choosing to wear masks. They do it because they are caring, compassionate people. And, you know, six, you know, we are known for our selfless service, which is why I think, you know, it's been wonderful what Godwaras have done during COVID in terms of serving longer to all communities, getting it out to people, running pop-up vaccine clinics. You know, I think, you know, it's been absolutely inspirational, humbling what the sick community has done. And I think, so we do it for ourselves, but also to protect others. I don't think anybody does it to please government. Thank you very much, Gersh and Dawa. Uh, Jess Gamal. These viruses have come from around the world. Mm. We've seen uh, the Delta variant, which originated in India. And now we have the African variant, Omicron. The next variant is suggested may come from South America. And is there any stigma being attached to the source of these deadly variants? In the fact that they are coming from third world uh, developing countries, poorer parts of the world? Um, well, the way I, I see it, it is going to be a very cohesive and collective effort by world leaders to to win over this, this virus. And uh, I would like to echo what Mr. Randawa said earlier, that, that it's important that um, you know, first world countries, they take responsibility and they lead um, to bring measures to, to third world countries and, and, and help them and support the people there to, to put those measures in place and implement those strategies which are working um, around the world. Um, it's, not, it's not going to be um, easy for, for anyone to, to get this done, but um, it's, it's important that we we just focus on this now. This, you know, the last two years have proven the fact that um, that COVID is is going to be is going to is going to be massive, massive issue for not just one country but for the whole world. And if we want to fight it, we have to do it together. We have to collectively take responsibility. Um, and uh, I think that it doesn't matter. You know, it could be it could be any part of the world, um, as long as uh, we are not working. We, if we are not working collectively, we won't be able to win over this. It's going to be collective effort. Otherwise, it's going to carry on year after year, and we will be just going around in circles. Gertz, uh, Jaskamal has described a uh, ideal situation, uh, something we'd all like to see happen, which is a collective worldwide effort. But that's not the reality. It's far from it. Vaccines are being hoarded and distributed in the developed world, and the, the, the de developing world is being left further and further behind. It doesn't seem as if uh, there's a global effort. Uh, it's not going to change. What do you think? Well, I think people learn from their mistakes, so I think you're absolutely right. Early on in this global vaccine effort, that's just not worked. Um, one of the things I, I, I talk about is performative philanthropy, when people pretend or act out of being generous, but they don't actually follow up uh, with real actions. Um, and I think we, we need to move away from this very old fashioned donation model of vaccines that simply doesn't work because around the world we need billions of doses, not millions. So rich countries promising to donate millions of doses is not going to work. It's not sustainable. So if we're serious, we need to help those poorer countries to build their own vaccine factories, share the patents, not worry about making money on this and vaccinate the world and that's the only way we're going to get out of this we need vaccine equity across the world 
and we need the rich countries to really show some leadership. So I would love for the British government to show some world leadership and you know, perhaps be the first to say we're going to help the uh, low-income countries to build their factories, share our patents uh, with our pharmaceutical companies and start to vaccinate the world. That's what we need. Thank you very much, Gurch and Jess Gummel, for your message of Sarbata Dapala in keeping with the Sikh principles of seeing humanity as one. We would like to see the whole world looked after, and we do hope the world leaders will take heed. Finally, perhaps we can start with you, Jess Gummel. How has this pandemic affected your life in the long term on a permanent basis? What are you taking away from this pandemic in your life? Um, that's a very philosophical question, and um, it, it is it is going to be it's going to take some time to to reflect on whatever has happened uh, over the past two years. It's never easy to um, to to look at um, all the events in that sense. But I think one thing that we we do need to take away collectively is that um is that that spirit of of solidarity which which has uh, really come forward in the past two years and um and and how collectively we, we we fought this this pandemic and how we came together to um to support and help um those who needed it and the communities working together and you know whatever we could do in terms of opening our doors and helping and supporting those who were vulnerable and who were actually in the middle of um, fighting this pandemic firsthand. And we need to carry on doing that. We should not stop at any cost. And we should really value um, the, the people who um, have um, given their lives and who have given um, hours and hours of work and effort to fight this pandemic. It's important that we reflect on it and we always remember that you know, these two years actually defined us as humanity and defined us as individuals. Um, and, and it's important that we always, always remember the message of, of our gurus that, um, that you know, education and knowledge is, is of no use until you put it for, for um, the good of uh, humanity. It's important that we always, always use our knowledge, uh, use our skills, um, use our learning to, to help and do save up. And uh, un unless we are performing that, it's in, it's it's going to be impossible to come out of these this this uh, this problem of pandemic is going to carry on. So that that message of solidarity is one thing which I would take away from it, and and always always practice this definitely. Thank you very much, Jaskamal. How has this pandemic shaped the personality and the outlook of Gurj Randhawa? Good. How has this changed you forever? Um, good question. Um, I guess I'm minded to think about the uh, Sikhi in, in terms of thinking around um, positivity and the whole notion of Jardi Kala and about you know being able to deal with adversity. Um, so and I've always been a sort of an optimistic person, um, sort of ever since my childhood. But I think COVID-19 has really sort of reinforced my sort of uh, belief in good in people. So I think, you know, just reinforcing what was said earlier, <clears throat> I think, you know, it's really shown that we can, as a country and as a community, be thinking about solidarity and compassion for others. I think there's so much um selfless service being done just not just by the sick community but other uh communities so i've seen you know as i said longer being served but also the nearest godwara to where i live for example luton godwara have now started a soup kitchen in the town square where you know they're serving those most in need but i know so many people have been doing this across the country and i know many godwaras have started doing online streaming of uh, keep them so it allows people to keep connected with Sikhi so maintaining their positive mental health and I know many people have started running like walking clubs or physical activity clubs 
with their sangha, then again, I think that's so good because it's allowing people to keep connected with each other, but also promoting physical activity. So I guess, you know, I, I'm, I'm enthused by the amazing compassion and caring that I'm seeing by so many people. Um, and I'm so proud that many Godwalas are at the forefront of this. Thank you very much for that uh, inspiring message. Gurj and Jaskamal, thank you for joining us on Community Matters. Community Matters to all of us in the Sea community and to our guests who've joined us and I hope we'll be regular contributors to this program. And we hope to bring many more different areas of interest to the community in the coming weeks. And we do hope this pandemic begins to recede and we can begin to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Taskamal Singh Sidhu, Executive Principal, Guru Nanak Sikh Multi Academy Trust. Professor Gajana Singh Randhawa from the Institute for Health Research, University of Bedfordshire. Thank you very much for joining us and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Wahiguruji Ka Khalsa. Wahiguruji Ka Khalsa.